Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of the Jacob Shapiro podcast. Uh, Rob and I are back at it for our weekly chat. Before we get into our weekly chat, I have two housekeeping notes for you. The first is thank you to those of you who have applied for Club CI so far. We have been overwhelmed and impressed with both the number of people who have applied and the geographic representation. So we've got people applying from Switzerland, Hong Kong, Poland, Italy, Mexico, the United States, Canada, Sweden, Australia, just to name a few. I've written to some of you directly. I have not been able to respond to all of you because so many of you have written in. Uh, But don't worry, I have forwarded all of your emails to our team. Um, We'll be reaching out to all of the applicants soon to schedule calls with me and Rob. Uh, you have a last chance to get applications in for this round. We will have a link to the application in the show notes if you want to learn more if you or if you want to apply to be part of Club CI. More on that soon. Uh, second housekeeping note. Uh, I'm impressed that I even got to November 14th. So my beautiful wife is due with our second daughter here any day now. Um, probably will happen this weekend, I would have to guess. Um, what that means is that the cadence of the podcast is going to be reduced considerably. We'll probably do something similar to what we did the first time I had a baby when I had a podcast. So we'll, we might release some old episodes from the vault that are evergreen. I also do have plans for one or two episodes to record over the next six to seven weeks um, that I think are super important that I've lined some really interesting guests up for. Uh, but by and large, it will be a reduced podcast schedule until we get into the new year. Um, so you'll have this one. Uh, we've got a good recording schedule for Monday. Like I said, one or two others that'll be here before the end of the year, but then a significant slowdown. And you may see us recycle some old content just to give you a taste of what's going on. Um, other than that, uh, that's about it. So enjoy the weekly chat with Rob. Hope you are all doing well. Uh, cheers and see you out there. Rob, we are back at it. Did you know that there's a company in Japan that exports ice to the United States? Just ice, like frozen water. Have you heard of this? I haven't. What's the deal? Uh, it's it's a company called Kuramoto, and their ice exports to the United States have soared uh, over the last four years from roughly 10 million yen, that's like $65,000 a year, to almost 70 million yen, so over $700,000 a year. And they are projecting a 25% rise in 2024 to 300 million yen. Um, and apparently their ice, it's its its purified from all impurities. I guess that's a, <laughs> uh, there's no bubbles, there's no minerals, they take it all out. It's perfectly clear. I was trying to figure out how they actually export ice. Like, do they just melt the, cl- the clear water and then does it get like refrozen in the United States? Anyway. Uh, the world is not so bad if we're paying for special ice to be imported from Japan. That's my key takeaway. <laughs> There's still some things to enjoy in this world, right? And one of them is apparently ice. I hope I get to the Very point where I'm ice. <laughs> importing ice. Like maybe it'll be laced with truffles when I get it too. Okay, so let's dive in. Um, I know everybody and their mom is covering the United States, and I think we have to say a couple things about the United States, but hopefully we can back into some of the other things going on in the world while also start, starting to make sense of, of what's going on here. Um, I know that for you, Scott Besant being floated as Treasury Secretary is one of the things that is, is most interesting. I, of course, have been sort of grappling with um, Rubio as Secretary of State and the debate around the defense minister and some of the other things that are happening. But um, I know that you've done a lot of work on, on Besant. So why don't we we talk a little bit about Besant and, and some of what we've seen out of out of Trump's early appointments. And then we can back into how the rest of the world is reacting around this and maybe some things that have nothing to do at all uh, with with uh, Trump and the political transition happening in the United States. But I'll, I'll leave you to kick it off with some thoughts about Besant. Yeah, and as you'll see, <clears throat> this is going to tie into China and Japan in particular because a lot of this, you know, once again is about current account balance and trade balance and trade policy, which our listeners may be sick to death of hearing of. But this is really important because I think it provides a lot of incremental information relative to what we've talked about last week and what you were speaking about with Marco. And whether or not Scott Besson does become the Treasury Secretary, according to Polymarket, he has a 67% chance right now. So it's looking fairly likely. I think it's a good example of what really smart people are saying or thinking about in terms of creating policies to address some of the imbalances and some of the issues that we talked about last week. And for those who don't know, Scott Besson is 
he is a really impressive guy. Um, he was one of the early Soros employees. So if you think of it, like George Soros is Pele and <laughs> Drucken Miller is fat Ronaldo Nazario. Uh, <laughs> then Scott Besson is maybe like Ronald Genio. I mean, he's, he's, he's a big, big figure in the investment world and very well respected, very, very smart. Uh, one of the first openly gay uh, people in the investment community, which is, you know, uh, I think something that came out in the mid 1990s, which at that time was, it's still pretty rare, but very rare back then. So really interesting figure. But he has been sort of doing the circuit now because he's the front runner and he's been airing his ideas, which I've been paying very, very close attention to because he doesn't yet have the ability to speak in dopey sound bites. So it's hard to just immediately grasp what he's saying or getting at because he still, uh, you know, for better or for worse, thinks like someone who realizes the world is complex and, and can't be simplified like that. So you really have to spend time with some of the things that he's saying and piece together some of these issues to get a sense of what he's saying to Trump. And this is of particular difficulty because you have to think, well, what is he thinking? And then what is the political packaging for this? You know, how is he describing this to Trump? So I'm going to do my best to interpret what he says. And maybe some of this is just wrong and maybe it will be completely irrelevant. You know, as you pointed out, we had an investment committee meeting uh, at Bespoke last night, and you said something along the lines of anyone who tells you that they know what's going on right now is a liar or, or a fraud, because unless you're eating breakfast with Donald Trump, you have no idea what he's going to do. And I think that's, I think that's right. And uh, I was thinking this morning about the W.H. Auden quote uh, from a similar period in history when he said, the best lack all conviction and the worst are filled with passionate intensity. And I think that's a nice description of the current environment. Uh, it's funny. I, I've been thinking, I, I've been thinking of Brian Windhorst in the early uh, LeBron uh, era where you knew that only, only Brian Windhorst knew what was going on with LeBron because LeBron was only talking to him and all the other stories were nonsense. Um, I was actually talking to a client uh, the, this week and he was like, I like that point. So I should only listen to the breakfast eaters about, about policy. And I was like, yes, the breakfast eaters. What a great term. So if you're trying to follow the ins and outs of the Trump administration, we need to follow breakfast eaters. Uh, one of which has leaked, by the way, to the Wall Street Journal that apparently Howard Lutnick is making a late play for Treasury's secretary uh, and that it's all a toss up. So uh, if I think also if, if if Besson doesn't make it to the finish line, that might also tell you something about um, about what the priorities are. But anyway, so so, so go ahead. Uh, Auden and, and Windhorse in the same podcast. This is what we do here. We like to cook. Yeah, maybe Besson had him at breakfast and Lutnick had him at lunch. You never know. Yeah, so yeah. Um, so anyway, that's the big caveat to this, but I, I'll, I'll jump right into the analysis because there's a few major issues here that I think are really important, that they really are a departure from what current policy is or has been if implemented. And honestly, I find deeply troubling uh, just in an objective way. So we can we can talk about this, but um, primarily I'm basing this on the interview that he just gave, Besant just gave uh, earlier this week with um, Mike Green at, I forget the name of the event, but one of the listeners of the podcast was nice enough to link to this. Um, I think it was Matt Casey. I'm sorry if I'm if I'm getting your name wrong. I didn't look this up ahead of time. So thank you, Matt, for that. Um, but the th key things in that speech, I would narrow down to a few major points. The first one is that there is a recurring theme of what I would call the bully policy. Um, and by that, I mean a few things. So first of all, uh, Besant is not very favorably inclined toward Jay Powell. <laughs> My man, Jay, no one goes after Jay. I have a lot of respect for Jay. They're coming for Jay. Yeah, they're coming for Jay. But specifically, you know, tying him 
him to the inflation, which I think is interesting, and implying that essentially Jay Powell is part of what he called, uh, you know, engaging in monetary, mo monetary, I'm sorry, modern monetary practice, not modern monetary mm -hmm. policy. In other words, the blatant um, sort of financing of government deficits to, to spur spending. So he's trying to paint Jay Powell and the Fed with sort of the deep state brush. I think that's the first takeaway, which is interesting because, you know, that's, uh, that's going to sort of set the tone for a lot of the big debates and conversations that we hear, you know, in the next few years. Um, the other thing in relation to that, that he brought up, which was particularly interesting on this bully theme is a few things. First, they spoke about sort of using regulatory levers to quote unquote, encourage banks to buy long-term treasuries that they can be buying more. They're not doing their fair share, Jacob, the U.S. <laughs> banks, which is very interesting um, and in a similar uh, vein, but in a separate part of the conversation, they spoke deliberately about forcing U.S. allies, specifically within NATO, to buy what they called what he referred to as military bonds at a good rate for the United States. Um, which I want to put that aside because there's a whole military part of this discussion, which I find very interesting. Mm -hmm. But if you take those data points and put them with the notion also that Besson is speaking about the need to term out the debt, because he spoke about how uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen, you know, reduced the average term of U.S. debt and brought it much shorter than it has been historically. So they're primarily issuing bills which the Fed has control over. Remember, the Fed controls the overnight interest rate. That's the only thing that it touches. So bills are sort of in the Fed's domain. Terming out the debt would mean issuing these longer term bonds, military bonds, bonds to you know, banks that are uh, on Team USA sort of thing. Um, and if you put this together, what you get is, is essentially sort of a coercive a coercive, excuse me, uh, finance approach to U.S. deficits, which if you think is a potential solution to what we're dealing with, but it's also one with lots of pitfalls. Is this, when you were saying military bonds, and forgive me for the sim simplistic question, or maybe it's not simplistic, I, I immediately thought back to like the what, what were they, freedom bonds or, or the war bonds that they were selling in the 1930s? Is it similar to that or is it, is it something completely different? Um, I don't know about the similarities, but what he was clearly talking about was this notion of, you know, he said, you know, Trump is going and saying that NATO members should be paying their way, paying their fair share. Germany, he called out Japan, he called out Korea, um, and he said, instead of, uh, you know, sort of browbeating them, he said, you can force them to buy a bond, buy a 50 year, he said, military bond at a good rate. And it's sort of an upfront payment for U.S. defense shield. You know, that's, that's essentially the idea that they're paying us for protection, you know, um, a uh, student of the mafia might call that protection money, <laughs> but that's how they expressed it. Yeah. I'm, I'm just looking at this really fast. It'll, it might be something to dive into more. Cause I mean, it is the idea that you, it's a way of raising money, I guess, without having to raise taxes to unpopular levels. And I mean, the, at the broader level, what you're talking about, I mean, you could call it coercive. I, I might go and say, I mean, it's, it's, quasi imperial i mean it's about it which is funny because i don't know if you've see, seen all the memes on, on some right-wing media where they're talking about like you know 2016 is a new hope 2020 is the empire strikes back and, and 2024 is the return of the jedi and and their like uh their organization of things um but if you're going to weaponize is the wrong word and the biden administration has weaponized the u.s dollar in in meaningful ways that previous administrations didn't but it sounds to me like you're talking more about explicitly imperial behavior where um you don't 
you don't get to be part of the U.S. defense network just by participating in the WTO and by getting rid of tariffs and by letting the United States police the seas. It's like, no, like we need to see something. We need to see some level of tangible investment in the United States to move this forward. Um, Is that kind of what you're getting at? That's exactly what they're saying. You need to help pay for our deficit, subsidize our deficit at low rates in exchange for our aircraft carriers to be patrolling your national waters, that kind of thing. So th- I, I think this becomes more clear when we get to the second of, you know, kind of three major parts of this. Mm-hmm. And that's really getting into the more military thing, because they he said some things that were very interesting, where the first of which was he expressed this idea that the United States should have what he called a green, yellow, red policy toward other countries. And if you are green, it means you have similar values to the U.S. You have, you know, you're you're in, in Australia or in England or you know one of our close allies. If you're yellow, you're somewhere in between. And in that bucket, he put India, for example. Um, and he said, if India wants to keep buying cheap Russian crude, then they can get into the red bucket. Um, so it's sort of a coercive. You know, imagine the axis of evil, but everyone's categorized along some spectrum. And then within that, he said, you could use tariffs as an enforcement mechanism to shape your commercial relationships and offer access to U.S. markets uh, within each of those categories to different levels. So red and yellow get punished, green, you know, do not, uh, that sort of thing. And very specifically, I think this is important, the way he talked about um, trade balances and military strength, I found very interesting. So Besant referred to what he called the military civil fusion of the Chinese economy, which I think he's referring to just the notion that on one level that the CCP is engaged in all private business to the extent that it has any military relevance and is monitoring and, you know, I mean, people who have talked about defense are are well aware of this. But at another level, what's clear, and this was probably the most interesting thing to me, was he said that the military civil fusion is tied to the Chinese trade surplus. And what he said was, if China didn't have this huge current account surplus, they would not be able to finance their military buildup. Because in his words, how else are they going to get the US dollar earnings to do so? So I just want to pause there because that's really important. And he spoke about Japan in the same way. He said, yeah, look at Japan. He said, they were, they were very good. They, were, they, they did the right thing last year and they dramatically increased their defense spending in the budget, which we've spoken about here uh, on the podcast. And he said, but they did it in yen. And that was the problem because the yen depreciated. And in the end, it ended up being less in dollar terms, which I find frankly, it's such a bizarre argument and really one where I think he's trying to explicitly tie mercantilism to military buildup and military capability in a way that has not really been true for a very long time. And I'm going to, I'm going to make a comparison here. That's going to get me in trouble um, because people are not going to listen carefully, but I want you to listen to everything I just said about bully capitalism. I want you to think about sort of the privatization and supply side kind of reforms and deregulation that they're, you know, intending to do. And I want you to think about this concept that appears to be getting pushed about, you know, mercantilism and trade surplus connected with military buildup and getting hold of scarce foreign currency to build, you know, military supplies, punishing some, you know, people who are allied with you. I mean, I'm punishing people who are not allied with you and rewarding and channeling trade to those who are allied with you. This is the playbook of the Nazi economy in the 1930s. This is exactly what they did. And I know that sounds, oh, well, he said Nazis, but like really think carefully about this. That was a strategy based on privatization 
and deregulation on its surface. You know, the Nazis privatized a lot of state assets. You know, they unleashed, quote unquote, private business. But at the same time, they used their bully power and coercive force to get businesses to sort of step into line. Those who were buddy-buddy with the regime got special privileges, got special contracts. Um, those who were not were punished. Um, sounds kind of familiar. The Nazis specifically channeled trade into certain allies, mostly kind of Eastern and Southern European allies, and raised tariffs against the others. And they were obsessed with this idea that you needed current account surplus, you needed exports to get foreign currency in order to build your military. And that's essentially what they did. If you read the accounts of that time, like the the rigor with which they scrutinized every single dollar of dollars that was spent on anything that wasn't, you know, steel, tanks, munitions, dynamite, bombs, uh, you know, anything that could be used for military purposes was extraordinary. And it was sort of this thinking uh, that, that, you know, by having a surplus, by, by exporting, that was going to give you the, um, the independence and the capability to build up militarily. So, uh, so I'll pause there, but all of those things put together and maybe I haven't tied them in a, in a nice bow, but those are the ideas that I see running as a common theme across a lot of these proposals. That's interesting. And I'm, I'm always wary of what Leo Strauss called the reducto ad Hitlerum. Um, but I, I don't think you're actually, you didn't actually invoke Hitler. You, you, invoked, you invoked the Nazi party. And, and one of the things that is lost to the history of World War II is that the Nazis were actually incredibly successful when it came to economic policy. A lot of Germany's economic miracle after the war, becoming this country that was known for cars and for its skill in manufacturing, Germany wasn't that before the war. That was something that emerged in the 1950s and 60s. And some of that was due to U.S. investment in Germany and, and shared um, intellectual property and things like that. But a lot of it was also because of all of the massive infrastructure investment that the Nazi party made in the 1930s. Um, a lot of especially West Germany's infrastructure was not hit. And if it was hit, it was quickly rebuilt. So that when you got to the 1950s, the British were out of money. They were completely indebted. They were losing the empire piece by piece. And Germany had all these shiny new trains and shiny new factories, and they were just pumping stuff out. Um, and all of that, well, not all of that, but a lot of that was due to what the Nazis did in the 1930s, the National Socialist Party, I guess, is what we should call them if we want to use their original um, moniker. Um, and it wasn't, you know, I, I would push back a little bit to say that they, they had other policies that they focused on. One of the first national socialist policies was a policy to increase the birth rate. So direct fiscal stimulus to families and to women to say that if you have a child, you get X amount of money directly. And if you have this many children, you get even more money because they were dealing with an absolutely ghastly demographic collapse um, after World War One and general sort of pessimism. Um, I'm also struck, I mean, uh, Maybe this is new for, for Besant. I mean, if you closely read Steve Bannon's ideas, I mean, he's been talking straight mercantilism since the very beginning. That is the thing that he has been pushing for a long time. So the, I think there will be wings of the traditional sort of Trump policy supporters who are in there. I also think it's kind of ironic. Uh, I was reading this thing about uh, Lutnick trying to, uh, you know, bully his way into Treasury Secretary. And apparently the thing that is causing problems for Besson or the most problems for Besson is you already alluded to them. The fact that he worked closely uh, with George Soros for, for four years. Um, so just a little, sort of, sort of a little interesting trick of trade there. But so the question I, I want to ask before we maybe get into some of the other things happening in the world and also how this connects to some other things happening in the world, um, I, without having done the work, I would have thought that we were, that comparing what U S policy might turn to might look more like the British empire sort of from eight, from 1850 up until world war one, what is different between sort of the state led capitalist model that you're talking about that Nazi Germany used in the 1930s and which other countries used in the 1930s versus a more sort of imperial access to the imperial metropole policy that the British use in, in the late 1800s? Um, well, just to clarify also, I don't want to, you know, the, the German 1930s example is one of many. And as you point out, the British 
imperial system also had a lot of similarities to what's being proposed here. Um, or the Japanese system in the 1930s was very, very, like, you know, it's not a reductio ad Hitlerium. No, no. I mean, um, <laughs> fascism was a global, fascism was a global movement and it had different variations. And it was this idea of, I mean, there were lots of different parts of fascism, but the economic model really was a sort of state led capitalist model. And I mean, Germany had its own problems. It had the hyperinflation that it was dealing with. It was dealing with, um, you know, rivals on its borders that were trying to punish it. It was having to pay war reparations. Like they had a lot of different things that they were working with. And then you did have this strange uh, political outlier, Hitler, who everybody thought he was just, you know, that you couldn't take him seriously, that he was just this crazy guy and that he would be used by different parts of the system or then ultimately embarrassed and kicked out. And it turned out not like he was going to put all of his cronies in places of economic and political power and and push forward. So, I mean, like th there are elements of it here. But yes, it is easy to think that, you know, a state led capitalist model that became associated with fascist movements in the 1930s was discredited by um, World War II. It was why I tried to make the point that if you're trying to be ruthlessly objective about this, which is really hard to be like just on the matter of economic policy, it's not clear that the National Socialists were actually so bad. Like they actually set Germany up for tremendous economic success. Now, whether you can have that kind of policy and have a, a government that does not turn into what the Nazi government turned into, well, that, that's an interesting philosophical and theoretical question. I don't really know. But if we're just talking about the brass tacks of economic policy, yes. Um, like the, it was not only the Nazis, there were lots of different um, things. I guess what I'm asking is, is, is it this sort of fascist state-led capitalist model or is it more, or what's the difference between that and a more traditional imperial model? Or is that literally just, hey, the victors get to write history and because Britain won, they got to call it the empire and because the Nazis lost, they had to be called the fascist ogres who tried to take over the world. Yeah. Um, no, it's a good question. I think, I think the big difference between those two models is the um, the let's call it the German model is more of an autarkic one mm -hmm. where the idea is to um, sort of uh, how do you say it's not focused on capital outflows let's just say that whereas the British model very much was the British model was, we're, we're rich, we have deep capital markets in the empire's core, we're going to export capital to the periphery in areas that are favorable to us, you know, our colonies and, and allies. We will build things in those places um, and we will import the stuff to build them from England. So capital is coming out uh, offset by manufactured exports, which is what China does today. Capital goes out, exports go out to offset it. Um, so that's kind of the traditional imperial model is, you know, we're going to exert control by exporting our capital to you because we're the ones with the money and you're not, you know, we're richer than you. What they seem to be proposing here in Besant's speech is sort of a weird mix of that and the German model, because on the one hand, they talk about building up U.S. manufacturing, specifically, it seems for military capabilities and sort of this idea of building up capacity in areas that are sensitive, that seems to be a, a major focus. So that would imply exporting military goods to these allies. And he actually said in relation to the China, uh, you know, military civil fusion discussion and how they need capital, uh, I'm sorry, a current account surplus to get the foreign currency to do their military buildup. He said something along the lines of, well, what are other countries going to do because they don't have this kind of trade balance to get the dollars to buy military goods? Which I thought was interesting because on the one hand, they seem to be suggesting that they're going to use the dollar as a tool to bind allies to them. Hey, we're going to give you dollars and you go to Lockheed Martin and you're going to buy, you know, this shopping list of equipment from them 
Um, that seems to be one sort of interpretation of what they're saying. Um, and interestingly, in a separate part of the conversation, he said, you know, uh, uh, President-elect Trump has been very clear in saying that he's not averse to a weak dollar. And some people will say that that's uh, not uh, reconcilable with the U.S. dollar as reserve currency, but I don't think that that's true, which is really interesting because I, I don't think it is reconcilable <laughs> <laughs> unless you coerce people to buy weakening dollars. Like if they're using it as a reserve currency, all else equal, it's more strong. And if they're not, it's more weak. It's strong it, because they want it. <laughs> it's a really difficult circle to square because also if, if you're using the dollar in that way, the dollar is no longer a global reserve currency. The idea of a global reserve currency is that unless you are North crazy North Korea, everybody like the dollar is what is at the center of the system. If you're saying some countries get dollars and some countries get medium dollars and some countries get no dollars, like already we're not talking about the dollar as, as a reserve, um, as a reserve currency anymore. Although that thing you said about, you know, uh, we give you dollars and, and you buy things from Lockheed Martin. I mean, that's the description of the U.S. Saudi relationship, basically in a nutshell, except you got some oil in there as well. So in that sense, it's not a whole lot that is new. It's just uh, applying it on a really sort of huge scale. Yeah, it is on a huge scale. And But just on the reserve currency thing, I think this is this is where I think the argument breaks down. And I think it's being served up for Trump. Because he wants a weak dollar, he wants U.S. exports to increase, but he also wants to attach our allies to us and bully them around, essentially. And those two things are not reconcilable, because if you are the reserve currency holder, if you are the depository of everyone's capital exports, meaning that their savings are denominated in dollars, they're, they're not saving in their own currencies, they're generating savings and they're exchanging them for dollars, then by definition, you are running a capital uh, uh, a deficit and a current account deficit. I know this is really boring, like, and it's we're getting into like the accounting. No, but no, basically, no, I, if everyone's going to be sending their, their, their money to you, you cannot just arithmetically, you cannot also have a, a, a manufacturing export surplus like those two things are the opposite of each other so either you're sending the money to them and you're exporting to them like the british did or you're getting the money from them in the form of hey we're building up reserve currencies and you're you run a deficit with them you know it's kind of if you go back to the late 1960s it's a similar dynamic i think and it's worth thinking about because at that time the u.s was a reserve you know uh, asset of the world. And, you know, it was like Jacques Ruff, the French finance minister of the time, very famously wrote a book called The Monetary Sin of the West. And he basically calls out the United States and says, hey, United States is the reserve currency asset, but they're running these inflationary policies. They're running these big deficits, they're spending too much. And they have this facade that you can exchange this for gold and we know it's bullshit. So we're, we don't want to hold dollars anymore. And, you know, very shortly after that, um, what was the guy's name? Connolly, the the Texan guy who was the uh, who was the uh, Treasury Secretary for Nixon. He basically, when they got into office in '71, he came out and said, you know, uh, I think this was a private conversation that was later recorded, but he said, we have to fuck these foreigners before they fuck us, like in sum and substance. And I think we're in a similar situation, um, you know, at the at the present time. But uh, where were we going with this? Uh, well, no, don't worry. I'll I'll, I'll 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 direct you because I I was poking around. It's funny, but based on some of what you said, I don't know if you saw that El Salvador announced that for the third time this year they're going to offer to buy back dollar bonds. Um, they're going to repurchase a series of notes between 2027 and 2034, uh, worth about 2.5 billion. And I bring it up because um, Naib Bukele, who a complicated figure, we've talked about him some on the podcast, I'm sure we'll be talking about him more in the future, um, suddenly looking very prescient because he bought the dip with Bitcoin, with government money. Uh, he was buying lots of, of Bitcoin for El Salvador. And El Salvador is a country that lost its currency in the context of globalization. It basically became a dollarized economy. 
and people and analysts were making fun of Bukele and, and not just making fun. The IMF has said that El Salvador's embrace of Bitcoin is one of the reasons they can't even conscience thinking about giving them a loan because it shows really irresponsible fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, and suddenly with Bitcoin floating over 90,000 uh, and with some of the things you're talking about with the dollar, uh, boy, does his bet on Bitcoin for El Salvador look interesting. And the, the other, you know, there are lots of different inconsistencies in what you're talking about from a policy perspective. Like it doesn't, it doesn't really, I think it fails the test of how you actually implement it. But one big difference is cryptocurrency does exist now. So if, if the dollar is going to go in this direction, if you're going to try and weaponize it more than it already has been, as it has been again, as it has been against Russia and the Russia-Ukraine war, like there are also alternatives and there are ways that the system is, is going to respond in different ways. And and the last maybe parting thought I'll give before maybe we move into into China specifically, because I think there's there's things to talk about there. I mean, this was something I I've been talking about um, a couple of times over over the past week. Um, early returns on on these Trump picks is that. He's doing what he did in the first term, which is he's picking different people who have different ideas uh, and who are probably going to clash against them. And he gets to sit on top of it all like it's The Apprentice, except it's it's the White House version. So I'm thinking about, you know, if you got Secretary Rubio in there, if Hegseth gets in for defense secretary, those are very different people coming at it from different policy choices. You talked about Besant. Um, and you even mentioned sort of the Chinese model of investing in other countries and building in other countries. That's a model that J.D. Vance has talked about something that the United States should emulate. So if you actually think about all of these different characters in a room trying to present policy to Trump and implement policy, they're probably going to be saying different things. Just think about think of this in terms of the um, the Department of Government Efficiency, aka Doge, um, you know that Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy are going to be co chairs of. Just the idea of co-chairs for an efficiency department, like, isn't there already a redundancy there? But that's part of the madness. It's like, put these two people against each other and watch them, watch them duke it out. So I, I think that's some of what's there. But why don't we turn a little bit to what's going on in the world? Because it, it does intersect with some of this. Um, folks might remember before the election podcast with Marco, Marco was on a couple of months ago and talked about um, a sea change in what he saw as Chinese monetary and fiscal policy, just you know, moving towards stimulus. And this has been a narrative for the last couple of months where China is finally taking out the bazooka. It's finally going to inject um, all of this capital into the system in ways that are different. And we've had three different meetings where it was, oh, they're going to announce it at this meeting. They're going to announce it at that meeting. And the latest meeting was um, November 8th. They were supposed to announce some of these policies. Um, and it just really hasn't come through. Um, so last Friday, they announced a $1.4 trillion quote unquote stimulus program, but it was all to deal with local government debt. So they're raising local government debt limits. They're making hundreds of billions of dollars available for local governments to tap over the next five years. Um, but we're fundamentally not in stimulus world. They can talk about how it's a $1.4 trillion package overall. Um, but we're not really talking about stimulus. We're talking about stabilizing local government finances. We're talking about trying to stabilize the property market with more tax incentives or more um, incentives to buy property in tier one cities. Um, it, it's just not really that sort of completely different way of doing things that we were thinking about before. And I think at least some of this might be because China's in a holding pattern. It wants to see where the direct where the relationship with the United States goes during the early innings of the Trump administration. Maybe they feel like they need to save the stimulus for an escalating trade war with the United States. Um, and maybe that would be a good time to deploy it because, hey, it's a national emergency and our economic way of life is being threatened, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm also just struck, you know, when you talked about openness and capital like if you read everything that is coming out of china even though they're the communist country they're the ones that are talking about openness and movement of capital and more foreign investment and we want all of these we want to be the, the most open country in the world from from a trade perspective so anyway we've we've you and i have talked about china on the treadmill to hell um i, I thought we should update on that because china keeps on either being expected to do something or promises to do something and it's just not happening um, and you can, you can see in Chinese equities that the market is sort of, okay, like wh when is it going to happen? What, what is going to happen next? I have a different view from the consensus on this and really rooted in a few things. The first is, as I talked about last week, if you look at the charts of Chinese equities, 
This is not a dead cat bounce. This is a face ripping bottoming pattern, which I think is really critical because there's been nothing but disappointment on the news front for the last month to six mm -hmm. weeks. This isn't like, you know, I mean, this was a while ago that you had the first rally and stocks are holding up despite all the, you know, the disappointment that's followed. That's absolutely critical to keep in mind. It tells us that something has changed. Um, so that's the first point I would make. The second point I would make is I think there's a real lack of rigor in terms of what the hell people talk about when they talk about stimulus. What stimulus? Stimulating who? Spending on what? Spending for for which you know aspect of the private sector? And I think there's just sort of this, again, getting to what we talked about in the wake of the Trump election victory, like, oh, they'll do something. Like stimulus is sort of this vague notion of, oh, they're just going to spend a lot of money. Like, okay, well, let's really examine that. Presumably, people are talking about consumer stimulus, so giving money directly to households. Um, it's not surprising to me that that's not happened. First of all, because that wouldn't do anything to change the underlying imbalances in China's economy, and they know that. They'll just be giving a temporary shot of adrenaline that will fade, just like the cash for clunkers. I don't know if you remember that in mm -hmm. 2008 when we were heading into recession and George Bush you know, gave the cash for clunkers and, and then they gave a direct check. You remember that? They just cut a check to everyone in America. And that didn't do squat. You know, that lasted like a hot minute, right? So I don't remember that. I, I mean, I'll give my, I was in college uh, at the height of the 2008 financial crisis. And I do remember going to Professor Peter Kassenstein's, uh, I believe, was it a international? It, it was some kind of political science class. And I remember we all sat down. I always sat in the second row. I was a second row. I didn't want to be a first row kind of guy, but I wanted to be close to the action. So I always sat in the second row, much to the, sh the chagrin of my best friend who always came to that class and always fell asleep. Shout out to him if he's listening. He knows who he is. Um, anyway, so it was like the peak. I, it was like one of like Bush had just announced some of these crazy measures and he came in and he took a dollar bill and he tore it in half. And he said, this is what the government is doing to your money. I'm dismissing class. Go to the ATMs and withdraw cash. And we like all ran for the exits. It was absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Well, damn. That's pretty, that's pretty intense. Yeah. Um, so, so what does stimulus mean? Um, uh, I think, I think what they're doing, uh, um, they realize what the situation is. And I don't think there's going to be a massive consumer stimulus coming because it wouldn't accomplish anything and they know it. The only way that they're going to achieve rebalancing, not to be a broken record, is by changing the structure of the economy where you're no longer implicitly or explicitly subsidizing government and private sector business at the expense of households. In other words, households need to make more money in their salaries, not by getting a stimulus. And until they do that, you're not going to have rebalancing. Now, will they do that? I don't think that they will. And to repeat what I've said in the past, I think it's fundamentally against the nature of the Chinese regime to empower individual households in that way. It lessens their ability to control and have levers over where capital is directed in the economy. Um, it would fundamentally change the regime, which is why I say like, I've, I've said in the past, this would be a huge undertaking if they were to truly do this. Um, so, so far, there's no evidence that they are doing it. And I think what we're seeing, you know, everyone sort of ignored this debt swap for the local government, uh, local government financing vehicles and, and local governments directly. This was actually really important and no one paid any attention because they're like, oh, well, there's no, no consumer stimulus. You know, they're not going out and just buying stocks. Um, but it's really important because it shows that the central government is essentially writing the same check that they did in the late 1990s bubble, which what they did in the wake of that debt, you know, malinvestment bubble was they nationalized the debt. They took political control of those entities that were, you know, indebted and, you know, running up these, these debts and essentially neutralize them. And they spent the next 12 to 15 years 
implicitly paying that debt off. So they didn't monetize it. What they did was they made households pay for it. They put it on the shoulders of ordinary people through lots of kind of backdoor hidden subsidy ways, you know, too low interest rates, whatever. But they ultimately grew out of that and, you know, sort of squeezed the belt, not on governments or on investment, but on households. And I think what this shows, this debt swap, is that they're probably going to try the same approach. And I really think that's the path of least resistance, as much as it sucks, just from a human standpoint. And I would love to see, you know, true change in the Chinese economy to, um, to benefit consumers and benefit individual people. Um, that doesn't appear to be the way that they're going. It looks like they're dusting off the late 90s playbook and that's not good for consumers. It means that they're going to be quietly and, you know, in backdoor ways, screwed and put over a barrel again. Um, and I think they're probably betting that through coercive mechanisms, it's going to be fine. I mean, that's they're an authoritarian regime. Um, you know, as I said before, uh, the... Um, the great academic and writer on authoritarianism. Um, uh, oh God, the guy who wrote the Stalin biographies. I talk about it all the time. He, I love him. Uh, it's like Steve Cochran. Yes, Stephen Cochran. There you go. As, as he pointed out recently in a, in a speech, he said, you know, if Chinese households aren't happy, the government isn't going to say, oh, here's the keys. Sorry, like we broke our unspoken agreement with you. Like that's never going to happen. It's an authoritarian, repressive regime. They're going to screw people over and they're going to prevent them from talking about it. And they're going to hide the fact that they're screwing them over. And that's what I think we have to expect. So all this talk about stimulus, I think, is worthless. It doesn't tell us anything. And it doesn't mean that China can't do well in certain ways or muddle through um, it just means that they're not going to change the underlying structures of the system, which is depressing, but probably was always the most probable outcome all along. Well, and we spent some time talking about some of the inconsistencies in potential U.S. government policy. Like China's guilty of this, too. So this is from um, um, the Economic Times ran a commentary from an NDRC commentator. Um, and so it, it has two different ideas. The first is that China needs to uh, construct a development pattern that is open to domestic and international dual circulation that is not closed and that openness is the prerequisite for national progress, uh, that no country can build itself behind closed doors and China has to be deeply integrated in the world economic system. In the same article, um, it is absolutely critical uh, for countries to achieve independence and self-reliance at a high level of development, strengthening the foundation of public, like you get the picture here. So and it's this is not just China. If you look at India trying to do self-sufficiency and also flirting with free trade at the same time, the EU trying to do some of these things as well. Um, so it's not just the United States that is looking for a new model here. I mean, it's, it's also all these different countries. The United States, just because of where it is in the system and because it's making changes, it has such has such an outsized impact. Yeah, and it's worth talking a little bit about Japan if we have time, because I think I guess there's a few things um, just to think about with regard to China and Japan. First of all, I think the Trump election actually, in, in the silver lining is that it does play into Xi Jinping's approach in some ways, because it makes the victimization narrative much more easy to tell. And if you look at authoritarian regimes, again, to just mimic Stephen Kotkin, because I think he's great on these subjects, they may not have a lot of the things that the free democracies of the West have, but what they have are stories. They have stories of resentment, stories of, you know, historical uh, maltreatment that they can roll out and use over and over again to, you know, get people to support them who otherwise would not, you know, based purely on sort of well-being measures, right? And this is going to really help the Chinese story of you know we're surrounded by enemies the us is a global bully and you know we have to stick together um i mentioned japan because i think people underestimate to what extent that kind of um 
outcome is possible in Japan. And I thought the interview that you did with, um, sorry, I'm forgetting everyone's names today. Tobias. Tobias. Tobias on Monday was really good. And one of the things that he pointed out, I thought he had a really nice quote where he said that one of the things that Abe did was he sort of promoted this idea that Japan should not accept its status as a declining power quiet, quietly, that they should seek to rejuvenate sort of the Japanese nation, the Japanese spirit, however you want to, um, however you want to interpret that. Make Japan great again. Make Jap- I mean, it is make Japan great again. I didn't want to say it that way, but it's essentially the same thing. And Japan is interesting because, you know, I was thinking if China did have an open system, how similar would the Chinese policy look to Japan right now? Like, would Xi Jinping find himself with like a minority government trying to get people to to rally behind his ideas, even though things haven't been going so well? Like, probably, you know. Um, and the LDP is is in a very similar circumstance, and it's easy to forget how non-democratic Japan is and how authoritarian in some ways it remains. Like you look at the justice system, for instance, like what a, what a mess. Like it's not a, (laughs) it's not a Western legal system in Japan in many ways. Yeah. I mean, so to be fair to Shinzo Abe, the, the title of his 2006, 2006 book was towards a beautiful nation is the English translation. So that was his version of, of make Japan great again. Uh, There's some irony though, in, in what you're saying, because, one of the reasons Shinzo Abe is such an important figure was because under his rule, the LDP strengthened the power of the Japanese executive in a meaningful way, in a way that it really hadn't been. I mean, it wasn't even it wasn't at the levels that the executive had in, in World War II or before that. But it really did strengthen the executive at the expense of democracy. And also the LDP, as we're finding now, became corrupt. Uh, the reason the LDP had such a poor, or one of the big reasons that it had such a poor showing in the recent elections was because all of these scandals tied to Abe loyalists, who it turned out took money from people that were supposed to be for campaign events or other things like that, and just lined their own pockets. Um, so I, I do think there's some difference here because the 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 reemergence of sort of this uh, fractionalism in Japanese democracy has everything to do with the scleroticism and corruption of the LDP not necessarily to do with Japan going back to the inter nisine fighting before. It's that the people were fundamentally dissatisfied with what was a corrupt party that was governing in a little bit of an undemocratic way. And one of the interesting things about Ashiba, who it turns out is going to be this prime minister of a minority government, we'll see how long, uh, and this is from from Tobias and some of the other you know analysis I've been reading, he cares more about democracy than he cares about Japan as the, as the pleasant nation or beautiful nation or whatever Shinzo Abe said. Um, and he may try to inject a little bit more democratic life, uh, or at least try to protect Japanese democracy in ways that Abe and some of his loyalists wouldn't. Um, but to your point, yes, I mean, look back at Chinese history, look back at Chinese history before the People's Republic, look back at uh, the period between the fall of of the Qing and, and between when, you know, then there's a literal civil war between all these different parties. Look at what, look at how Chiang Kai-shek governed Taiwan for uh, generations before Taiwan was willing to experiment with, with democracy. So um, I, I think you're right. I think that it would it would probably look uh, pretty disoriented and pretty domestically focused and, and things like that. The flip side of that is that would it would it empower the individual to do things? And this is where your your question about narrative really matters, I think, because um, and there's not enough connections between young American people and young Chinese people, but you know, from my sense of it, you know, trying to read Peter Hessler and trying to get a sense of what young Chinese people want. It seems to me they're very proud of their country um, and they're very proud of where they've come. And yes, they, they don't really have any frame of reference for what it means in the United States to have those sorts of things. But, you know, the, we're, we're importing ice from Japan. They're talking about uh, clawing out from uh, absolutely crippling poverty into, ooh, I can, I can buy a a condo in this second tier city. Great. Like I I don't have to sleep inside anymore with the animals. So I I don't know, maybe I'm being too flippant there. No, I don't think you are. Um, And ultimately what I'm trying to get at is I think as Americans, we take Japan for granted. Um, You know, I always think of the uh, Dave Chappelle skit, the black Bush, where he's talking about all the allies who came Mm -hmm. to, uh, 
Gulf War Part Two, and he said, "Oh, yeah. Japan's sending playstations." Japan's sending playstations. They at least got a call out. Most most of the other countries did. Yeah, and I think that's sort of governs our views, especially even you know highly educated, well traveled Westerners who go to Japan. Like you interact with a certain type of person, and you're interacting with you know the outer protocol of Japanese society, which like French society, there's a very well-defined protocol for how you behave in public with people mm -hmm. that we're not used to. And so we sort of have this view of like, well, they're just so polite. They're just, you know, they're peace loving, you know, they're just going to kind of shuffle off and decline gracefully and shrink and blah, 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 and make playstations and manga. And, um, and I, I think that there's a, what I want to say is, you know, for the first time in the post-war period, Japan doesn't have a majority government. And outside of the brief sort of flirtation with the DPJ after the great financial crisis, which lasted like a hot minute, and then we went back to the LDP, this is a very important transition in Japan. And it shows how the system of the post-war period has truly become exhausted. It became exhausted in the 1990s when the LDP really lost its ability to essentially control everything by distributing goodies. You know, that was like the Tanaka model of the flywheel of we'll give you we'll give you stuff in your local government and your local, you know, community and in exchange you vote for the LDP. Like that was something that worked for a very long time. And as that sort of became exhausted and you came into the early 20s, 2000s, like as you pointed out in the podcast on Monday, like voter apathy has just increased. Like turnout has been bad really really bad for a long time people just don't care they're exhausted the ldp is a spent force so now for the first time they're a minority government it's sort of chaos no individual party is really on the rise and i just think you know it's worth just taking into consideration because i don't think the consensus view even contemplates this that you could have a similar sort of nativist like there's a very strong strain of right-wingism in Japan, and Abe sort of tapped into this as a minority uh, uh, strain within the LDP itself. But I wouldn't underestimate the appeal of that and the ability of that kind of thinking to, like, they don't have to have a majority in Japan. They could just be the most coherent voice to really take the driver's seat in a period when Japanese politics and policies sort of is rudderless. Um, yeah. In another way, what you're saying is, and, and I mean, not to compare apples and oranges, but I mean, what's happening in India, the ideas around Hindu nationalism, I mean, sort of a similar dynamic at work. Um, I, I also think it's not a coincidence that, you know, the two countries that are flashing the most political instability in the quote unquote developed world uh, over the last couple of weeks are Germany and Japan, because these were the linchpins of US strategy post World War II. And Trump really is authoring a extreme change in that strategy and so if trump is if if a trump administration is doing even half of the policies that you mentioned that besant was considering or talking about uh, the countries that are going to feel that on the first level are countries like germany and like japan and watching how those countries evolve is going to be interesting and, and to close out just uh, you know all sorts of things are always happening that get relegated to page eight that nobody actually cares about. And, and my, there were a couple this week, but one that I thought was particularly important, which goes back to another thing we've been talking about on the podcast a lot, is that Xi Jinping, he's going to go to the G20 summit that's going to be held in Brazil from November 17th to 21st, but he's decided that he's going to go to Peru first. And he's going to spend some time in Peru meeting with the president of Peru and looking around at all the ports and things that the Chinese have bought up. So I, th I think you're right that there, you know, we should be looking at countries like Japan, like Germany, like South Korea. How are these allies in the U.S. alliance network going to react to changes in how the United States or changes in expectations of what the United States has for its allies? There's also what is the United States going to do about South America? Because one of the things China is doing is it's reaching out into that part of the world and it's doing what it did in Africa in the same way. It's buying up infrastructure. It's building infrastructure. It's getting access to materials and minerals and resources like the Monroe Doctrine is getting slowly chipped away um, as we start worrying about the South China Sea and what's going on in the Middle East. Like that's going to be an interesting foreign policy dynamic to watch. And that's not one I have a good sense of how the Trump administration is going to proceed. Uh, to the extent they cared about Latin America the first time around, it was that Bay of Pigs light sort of operation around Venezuela that was absolutely ridiculous. So um, 
I don't know. Uh, we've already been going hours, so we should probably leave it there. Anything else you want to say to the listeners, Rob, before we pick it up next week? Well, the last point I just want to make briefly, because this ties into the beginning of the conversation, what you just said is if you put yourself in Xi Jinping's shoes and you assume, like we talked about before, that you're not going to rebalance the Chinese economy, like this is the system you've got. What do you do? You know, and one of the most obvious things to do is to pursue that British model. Okay, you have you know, too much capital, you need to put somewhere, you need to invest somewhere. Well, instead of building ghost cities and, you know, the interior of the of China, maybe you export that capital to Africa and Central Asia and to Peru and build a big port. And oh, by the way, it's the capital coming out, but then they're going to buy your manufactured goods. It's the British model. Yeah. And you're going to buy their lithium and their copper and their like. You're yeah. going to get their lithium and their copper. And that could keep that treadmill to hell going for an awfully long time if you can find the scope uh, externally and like avoid areas of friction to do it. And that's that's something to really think about because that seems to be what they're doing. All right. I think we hit it all. Should we leave it there? Let's leave it there. 